Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio. Join George Smart and Frank King as they talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Today, U.S. Modernist Radio welcomes Michael Hammond from World Architecture News and Brian Shawcroft, the oldest practicing architect in North Carolina. And now the host of the show, whose favorite architect is Mike Brady, George Smart, and Frank King. Thank you, Tom. Welcome to the show. If you're thinking, hmm, Mike Brady, that's a familiar name, then you probably grew up with the TV show The Brady Bunch. Hmm. Mike Brady was a dad, and of course, he is famous for projects such as their house. That's it. We cannot find any other Mike Brady projects ever mentioned. Maybe some of our listeners no other famous fictitious projects that Mike Brady did, but he did that wonderful ranch house with a stairwell, and you may have seen the Snickers commercials that have been done recently and playing on and off since the Super Bowl. There's always backstory. That's right. <laughs> Even a fake, fake architect has a backstory. From time to time, we give away prizes on U.S. Modernist Radio, but you have to enter to win with that mid-century modern method, the postcard. You can send one to U.S. Modernist Radio in care of Soundtracks, 302 Jefferson Street, Suite 160, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27605. And we'd love to hear from you. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Greg Kelly of Modbox USA and Sarah Sonk of Moho Realty. ModboxUSA.com is where your mail would feel so much more safe and loved in one of these <laughs> incredibly <laughs> strong metal boxes that looks like it's straight out of 1954, like it's been sitting on your grandma's house with the nice red flag sitting up on the side. These colorful mid-century modern mail boxes complement your home and turns mail time into party time. You can see one now at modboxusa.com. We're also sponsored by Sarah Sonk of Moho Realty who is a real estate agent that gets it. She loves the modernist houses you love. She cares about design and legacy of good architecture, and she brings expertise, experience, and track record to close your deal. www.mohorealty.com or 919-601-7339. And now here's Frank with the news. And just in time, I love when you bang on that mailbox. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> there you go. In France, the exponential growth in the number of cremations due to changes in customs and traditions questions our cultural illusions on what a crematorium should be like. This has resulted in a project called Crematorium in Amains, designed by, and George, maybe put these names in here. I'm going to butcher each and every one of them. <laughs> Phileas Atelier Dupont, Ignacio Prego Architectures, Jean Bocabelli Architecti, and somebody <laughs> named KOZ Cause, whoever that is, which is based on the theme of the circle. The building is based on the theme of a circle as a symbol, which makes sense, uh, universal and timeless, which is representative of, this is all, by the way, from the designer, which is representative of clearly identifiable themes, such as the central position of the deceased person, the fluidity and diversity of the journey, and blending into the landscape. Now, the building is both funeral home and crematorium, so the designers went to great lengths to hide the ovens and the chimney. I'm not making that <laughs> oh. up. With this in mind, if you attend a funeral service there, my advice is to avoid the door labeled smoking lounge. <laughs> oh. Oh. Too soon? And now from my favorite online architectural magazine, Curbed, Brown Nose, Party of One, Brown Nose, Party of One. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the escape traveler, the fab new mobile tiny home with the major amenities like the full-size oven and bathtub well despite already offering one of the more indulgent tiny homes available the maker of the escape traveler has just launched an even more in quotes spacious version the escape traveler xl clocking in at a palatial 319 square feet which according to the manufacturer can sleep up to eight people <laughs> yeah 
Eight people. Uh, if you stack them like Legos, use a shoehorn and bacon lube. And uh, probably the first time the words bacon lube were ever used in connection with architecture. The Beijing-based architecture studio Penda has revealed renderings for a 200,000-person city made out of interlocking, living, growing, wait for it, bamboo. The houses would be constructed modularly and would actually become more stable as more were built. Apparently, and this is a quote, as the number of inhabitants keeps growing, the structure gets extended to accommodate multiple communal spaces, one of the architects explains. In China, home of the giant panda, whose diet consists mainly of, wait for it, bamboo shoots and leaves. <laughs> you know what they say, you eat a Chinese city and three hours later, you're hungry again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the modernist news. Thank you, Frank. Our guest this morning, Michael Hammond, is co-founder and editor-in-chief of World Architecture News, the original digital news channel of the Built Environment Media Group. He chairs the World Architecture News Awards jury panel and produced a great series of podcasts called Shop Talk, which has featured many of the world's leading architects, including Raphael Vanoli, Thomas Heatherwick, Richard Rogers, and Rim Kulhas. Prior to World Architecture News, Michael spent 25 years in construction project management before taking up writing. He authored the book Performing Architecture, and he has been featured in the Architects Journal, Architect, British Airways Magazine High Life, which I think you can only get in the first class section, CNN, CBC, the BBC, the London Evening Standard, and the Radio Southern Florida Architects Radio Show. Our second guest... Before the Beatles, before the Rolling Stones, architect, photographer, artist, and Jaguar driving Brian Shawcroft was Raleigh's North Carolina British invasion. Born in Nottingham, England, and graduating from the West Essex Technical College and School of Art, it followed with a Master's of Architecture at MIT and jobs with Page and Steel in Toronto, Tomei and Maxwell in London, Slater Urine and Pike, Back to Page and Steel, and Eduardo Catalano, where he worked on the Juilliard School of Music in New York City, among other projects. Henry Camp Hefner brought him to North Carolina to teach at the NC State School of Design, where he served as an associate professor and lecturer in architecture at the school from 1960 to 1968. He is recognized for designing much of the modernist home inventory in our area from the 1970s through the late 1990s, as well as offices, schools, and churches. In 1991, he was awarded the Camp Hefner Prize for achievement in the modern movement in architecture. And each year, NC State gives a Brian Shawcroft Prize for hand drawing, now a lost art. So welcome, Michael and Brian. Thank you. Hello. So gentlemen, let's start off with a, a cultural question. Is architecture any different between the UK and the US, either in how it's produced or in how the public tends to treat it? Yes. Well. Starting on the uh, the design side, you guys are still using feet and inches. <laughs> I can't believe Sorry. that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, it, it's it's great that there are differences, and I um, most of the firms that, that we work with and the the architecture that we're uh, we're you know we're working with through our news channel is you know, are large international firms, and it's great that there are there are still differences. I mean, we're you know we are we are catching up over here. I mean, we're we're getting a lot more malls now, whereas, you know, we used to have high streets. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. We apologize yeah. for exporting malls. <laughs> we're, we're, we're um, you know, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole thing's changing, and, and there's a lot of concern, I think, in some of the architects in London that the, the cities around the world are all becoming the same. Um, and, and, yeah, I think that, that that's a real... Um, you know that, that's a real challenge, but it, you know it, it, it's great that the that, that cities are you know keeping their own identities. You know, in in some respects. Now, World Architecture News. How did that start up? It was about ten years ago, a little more. It was yeah, it was exactly ten years ago. Um, yeah, I, I was I was uh, doing uh, fr freelance journalism. Uh, I was writing for a number of magazines. And um, everything was kind of insular at that stage. The, um, most of the trade mags were, were in print. You know, over here we had the Architects Journal, and I think, uh, I think you know, you, you guys, are, you know, the um, uh, Architecture Record. Uh, and, and, and 
typically, you know, these national journals were being, you know, printed and distributed, um, you know, through newsstands and whatever. And, it, and architecture, you know, people were flying around, people were, were traveling more, and architects were doing international work. And um, and I, I tried to, to write a few stories for the Architects Journal uh, about British architects working in, in Tokyo. And um, I, I got them thrown back and said, oh, no, no, they're a bit, they're a bit too foreign. Um, you know, we, we like writing about uh, English projects. And I said, well, they're English architects. And it's really exciting because they're building these skyscrapers in Tokyo. And all, no, it's not, not really for us. Um, so I, I had this idea then of, of, of just maybe starting something that was totally uh, unshackled to paper, uh, that was, you know, could embrace the, the digital world and, and um, you know basically we were in the right you know, the right place at the right time and I uh, talked to a couple of people I knew and they just thought it was a great idea and put some money into it and um, so the, the first few news reviews that we sent out it was just myself in a second hand laptop in a coffee shop or wherever I happened to be on a uh, Tuesday we used to send them out and as I say it just it just picked up and, and, and we just got a huge following re really quickly of course it's all changed now there's a you know there's a whole shed load of competition out there but uh, yeah it's still still pretty exciting so how big has world architecture news become well we're we're people are quite often surprised at how small we are. Um, so we, we were always told we make a lot of noise for a small company. Um, so do we. <laughs> so we, yeah, we we've, we we were pumping out news for a, for for a few years before we started doing awards, and and that's when we really started to properly engage with the architectural community. We. Um, it, you know, it's great reporting on projects which have got fantastic images and we can get, uh, you know, get a lot of interest and, and excitement. But it was once we started doing the awards that we started to understand more about what was going on and we started to see uh, meet architects every, you know, every jury session. And, and that, that's been really big for us. And so, you know, we're, we're just constantly meeting architects and, and, and seeing them you know, ju judge the awards, and then we started having some events. Um, so, you know, our audience is, is, is truly global. And, and I know these days, I mean, everybody says, oh, you know, we're international, but um, we'll sometimes go to a judging session in London and the, ju the judges will all be looking at the table and say, well, hang on, there's, there's, no, there's no projects from England here or no, no, no British projects. I said, well, we said we were global. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> So, so we're, we're, we're sometimes better known in Australia or South Africa than, than we are in the UK. Yeah, we're huge in Venezuela. We have four or five listeners down there that tune in all the time. <laughs> in England, architects are revered in a different way. I mean, you actually give knighthoods to them and they're and sirs and lords. Lordship. Yes. You start with a knighthood and move up to a lord. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know the progression. Yeah. That, that happened to Richard Rogers and uh, Norman Foster, I think, that process, um, didn't it? Norman uh, Foster is, is Lord Foster, and he That's started right. out as Sir Norman That's Foster, it. yeah. And, of course, his buildings in London, there's a, one of his buildings the which has got been nicknamed the Gherkin, is... Oh. A very, yes, we know the Gherkin. Yeah, yeah it's very, right on the Thames. Very, uh, in the city of London, in, actually in the city of London, the city of London, I don't know whether everybody knows, is only one square mile within what is the county of London, and that one square mile is probably the highest rent in the whole of England, so the buildings must go up, finally. The Bank of England took up most of it for a long time, but the latest building, which is the Leadenhall building by Richard Rogers, who designed the Pompidou Centre in Paris, is one of the most interesting buildings that's gone up in London recently. 
and it was all prefabricated. The only poured concrete was in the foundation. Everything above that was prefabricated and shipped in as far away as China as some of the parts came for that building. And it was built with one crane that climbed its way up and it's 40 some odd stories. It's one of the highest buildings in London now. And it's very interesting and an incredible, clever plan with the core separated from the main uh, office space to give clear use of that office space and the core which comprises of elevators and um, washrooms and stairs, fire stairs, everything, are all contained in a core that is parallel to the main space, which is clear of all columns and interruptions of, of the space. Michael, London has become, besides building some really neat buildings, has become a real exercise in urban planning. With projects such as the Garden Bridge going in, and I'm sure some others, you could tell us about. Yeah, I did just to, just to pick up on um, uh, Brian's. Uh, he, he mentioned Foster's building that the, it is affectionately known as the Gherkin. Um, did, did that was that was one of the first um, buildings that was given a nickname, and I, I think it might have been the London Evening Standard that did that. But it was actually designed um, on a on a napkin, and it was it was uh, it was actually in the shape of a pine cone. Um, but it got um, depressed rather rather rudely. It was originally known, I think, as the erotic gherkin. Uh, not, not quite <laughs> sure. <laughs> Isn't that redundant? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds yeah. like a nightclub you would go visit, the erotic gherkin. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the lead of the whole building, obviously, that um, Brian was talking about is, is of course, the cheese grater. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, what, what, one of one of one of my one of, one of my favourite anecdotes on the, the nicknames, which I think is pretty unique to, to London, is the uh, is the, the, the shard of glass. Of course, uh, London Bridge Tower by Renzo Piano. Now, I'm pretty sure that uh, that press didn't get a chance to nickname that because. Uh, Mr. Piano, when he was presenting the scheme for London, was trying to make this building uh, uh, not as bulky as it was. So he, he came up with the nickname, it stands in the horizon like a shard of glass. Well, the, the top of the building from a distance, yeah, sure, it's, it's, it's pointed, but if you go around London Bridge, um, there's nothing slender about the bottom. This, this is a mammoth building. And obviously, it's, 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 a, it's a terrific, a terrific and very exciting building built over the station there. But um, I think he, he was very, very clever there to get ahead of the game before anyone had a chance to, to name it. So... Uh, um, but there's, there's a whole lot of other names of, of buildings around the city there. But sorry, I don't know if I answered the question. I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Getting carried away here. In England, modern architecture has coexisted rather well alongside buildings that are hundreds or maybe even a thousand years old. In contrast to America, where we get upset if something from 50 years ago is next to something that's new. Now, how does England manage that that tension, or is there any of old and new buildings being together? Oh, uh, I I, th I think the, uh, the the tensions are, 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 are running right the way through, and 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 actually make it such a delight. I mean, it it is one of the most extraordinary things if you're walking through the streets of London and you, you, you're, you're either in the city, uh, Brian was mentioning. I mean, all the buildings are going up, and then just in a gap between two glass skyscrapers you'll see this tiny little old church that was obviously huge when it was built um i mean it's just the most amazing experience and, and likewise you can see it the other way around you're standing near a historic building and then you know sort of popping up in the back somewhere is, is you know is, is one of the towers it's a strange thing but it works but uh, you know as you were saying there is a tension and not everybody likes it and you know you, you usually get a, a pretty good indication from the cab drivers or in the the, the local views on a particular building but uh, yeah it's, it's an it's an exciting place and and i think you know we don't have the grid 
uh, of, of New York. So the, the buildings are grown out of the, the historic routes through the you know the, the you know the twisty lanes and the river, uh, and that gives it more of a you know haphazard. Uh, feel and and that's maybe one of the reasons why it works, but it it is it is pretty exciting. Do projects have as many lawsuits as they tend to have in the U.S., where someone's protesting a building being built or protesting something not being built or being destroyed or not being destroyed or all that kind of stuff seems to go on here routinely. I- Absolutely. I mean, I'm not involved, thank goodness, in, in the process of getting permissions for buildings. But um, our chairman, Richard Coleman, he he's, uh, he's kind of specialises in this area, and it is the most incredible process. There are so many bodies, protest groups of four, as you say, four and engaged, and there's community groups. And the, it, it's to, when you hear of all the processes that people have to go through to get a building put up, it's amazing that anything ever gets built. <laughs> 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 oh, really, it's just just crazy, and and it, you know it's a lot of determination needed by the architect and ingenuity to to not just design the building but to to weave it in to make it acceptable. It's it's a major part. It's a major challenge, for sure. How long did it take for them to plan and execute Terminal Five out of Heathrow? It seems like that was twenty years, twenty five years. I, I I think that was about seventeen years. And, and I'm sure you're probably you're probably also aware that the Baracus Airport in Madrid, by the same architect Richard Rogers, was conceived, designed, funded, delivered, uh, and operational all during the time Terminal Five was in discussion. <laughs> we are we are good at um, taking the, the long term, and I think the huge success that everybody has is our high speed one rail line, which is just brilliant, obviously going from St Pancras into, well, it it has to be one stop at the the tunnel, but I think it was actually completed 10 years after the the tunnel. Um, But um, yeah, we we, we do bureaucracy quite well. After World War II, due to all the bombing that had happened in England and especially in London, I worked on the County of London plan, which was created during the war in 1943, it was published, and it was a complete redesign of London. And there were three priorities at the time, Uh, Stepney and Poplar, which was the East End, had been bombed the most. And then another, and I worked on it, a road roundabout in the south of London called the Elephant and Castle. Sure. <laughs> and then one other area. And that road roundabout, which I spent two years working on in 1946 and 47 before I went in the army, it took 17 years before the first stake was driven in the ground. <laughs> So it's not just America that has long-term projects. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, I've heard for years that a certain Prince of Wales is not a fan of modern. Uh, how far does that go back? Is that uh, passed along like the uh, crown uh, over time? No. There's some. I've been checking into that. To me, he's an amateurish dabbler in watercolors, and that's all. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he has assumed that he's a... The British Navy is arming the missiles now. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, there goes your Sir Brian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he has been responsible for many really serious, good modern architects losing work in London, especially. Really? Yeah, like what? Can you tell us? Because he would get on a commission... And people in England are somewhat afraid of royalty one way or another, or they admire them like the Queen, for instance. But he has already, apart from not having any knowledge of architecture, (laughs) other than living in palaces, uh, he... um, His personal life hasn't been too good either, (laughs) I you think... (laughs) Oh. Hey, Camillo, uh, by the long face. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I despise him, actually. 
I think he's used well, his used his position as a Prince of Wales to um, do a lot of damage, and especially for modern architecture. Let's hear from Michael. Yeah, I was just. I mean, obviously, Brian's um, touched on a, a very sore subject, and the, the, the wounds of one certain speech are, are only just healing. The, 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 that, the, the speech, the Carbuncle speech, that, that that has gone down in the annals of history, architectural history here, was was quite an interesting. Just to give, give a little bit of context, I mean, the bomb damage that Brian mentioned in the in the in the Second World War, I mean, was you know pretty significant in. In the cities, and and we'd thrown up a lot of uh, concrete buildings to to get things you know rebuilt quickly, and and in that kind of period in the you know the 60s and 70s, our architecture didn't have a good name, and and it, you know pop popular the public view of architects was was not that good. Now we were just coming out of that, and I'm pretty sure the timing of this was that we had the Lloyd's Building, I think was completed, Richard Rogers Lloyd's Building, um, and you know a brave new. This is was something really, really new and and and, and you know really groundbreaking. And Prince Charles didn't like it, and he made this, this devastating speech. I think I, I, I've, I've forgotten the details, but at, at an RIBA uh, event, and he came on as a star guest and, and devastated a proposal for um, what one of the galleries in, in Trafalgar Square. I think it was the National Gallery. National Gallery. And managed to capture the public kind of mood against architecture and it, and it was it was truly devastating as Brian said it, it it did it set back the whole process by I mean some people say 20 years it just everybody was terrified to put in uh, proposals for modern building so yeah it, it was an extraordinary time uh, but I think um, he's not got the power well he did intervene intervene as I'm sure you know in the Chelsea barracks scheme but that was um Tell tell us about that, Michael, because I don't think our listeners know about that scheme. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of large scale redevelopments going on in in London, and uh, Chelsea Barracks was 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 a huge project, and it was being funded by the Qataris, and there was a scheme out there um, to redevelop it, and Prince Charles wrote a letter direct to one of the princes. Uh, of one of the owners and kind of bypassed the entire process of planning permissions appeals and all you know all of the established processes and it got pulled um, the addition to the national gallery in Trafalgar Square was a competition back in the late 50s I did it myself when I was in Toronto, so it must have been the late 50s, and it was sponsored by the newspaper, not the Times, but the other pretty good newspaper, and the person who won it was um, Denise Scott Brown's husband, and it's the worst... Robert Venturi. Robert Venturi, and it's the worst building I've ever been in. The worst. One of the worst in London, oh, yeah. Man. To bring have to bring an American over to England to do fake Georgian architecture is un <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> that we have to do that. Oh my god. Brian's new album, No Filter, is available in stores. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the uh, that's what age will give you. You know, you don't you don't care anymore. No. <laughs> Michael, how about the the infrastructure projects that are going up across the the UK and and elsewhere in Europe? I mean, I'm reading about the the Crossrail tunnel going in, and just this huge manner of connecting people on mass transit uh, by foot by changing the traffic pattern. It seems like London, as a as a vibrant city, is also doing a pretty good job managing its transportation. Yeah, I, I have to say. Cross, Crossrail is, is is amazing. I mean, I I, I mentioned the, uh, the the tardiness of the high speed link to to France, but um, Crossrail is one is one of those things. Us, us British, uh, we're very good at criticising ourselves and being self demeaning, but the Crossrail is just amazing. It is an extraordinarily big project carried out literally through the, through the heart of the city, 
and oh, the taxi driver of the game would disagree, but <laughs> given the scale of the project, it is incredible that you, you, you can be standing in, in, you know, in Oxford Street, you know, looking in the shop window, and then if you look in a crack in the hoarding, you, you, you see down five levels, and there's this monster uh, engineering project going on, and the guys in the street, just you just can't tell. Um, but it's coming out of the ground now, and it's, I think all the tunnels are, are dug. I've been, I was down there, and it's one of those things as a, as a kid, you know, boys so I was going down and seeing these monster machines digging underneath the shops in, in London. I and mean, it is something that, you know, you see something like that under construction, you never, never forget it. And, and it, I understand that's on time, uh, on budget. It's, it's a great achievement. So we can do it when we, uh, when we set ourselves to it. These giant boring machines are like 40, 50 feet tall. There's one in Seattle boring under Seattle that is 54 feet in diameter, yes. That's the biggest in the world, isn't it? Big yeah, Bertha. and it was made in Germany, and it's about 500 feet long. It's a train wow. on rails, and it cuts its way and moves forward as it goes and gets the stuff out the back and hauls it off. It's an incredible machine. It must have cost millions and millions of dollars, but they've got two in Seattle, one for the major moving the highway number five, which is, runs right across the waterfront in Seattle mm -hmm. and is about to collapse in the next earth tremor. And the other one is for the light rail system that they are developing in Seattle. They, they are amazing machines, aren't they, Brian? They, they, they even put the, the cladding, the, 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 I think they're still cladding yeah. as they go along. I mean, they, they completely build, build the shell of the tunnel. It digs and it builds at the yeah. same time. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. I've seen it. I've actually seen it. A friend of mine knew the engineer in charge of it, so I got a, the full tour. It was absolutely amazing. His name wasn't El Chapo, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but the mayor of uh, Seattle lost his job because a lot of people wanted to continue the monorail system. Yeah. And they found out that the cost of it was greater than the surface light rail system. Speaking of El Chapo, Michael, you might want to get this story. We read a couple of months back that uh, El Chapo hired an architecture firm to design the tunnel to get him out of his most recent jailbreak. <laughs> that would be a great interview for you on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> right, thanks for that, Tim. The tunnel architect. Yeah, although it was not um, modernist, they didn't want, you know, floor to ceiling glass in the <laughs> right. escape tunnel. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that that just ran by? That was El Chapo. <laughs> hey, Brian, what was Raleigh like in the swinging See, 60s? It, I mean, it. Uh, well, there were three restaurants. <laughs> Yep. The Canton. Yes. Yep. Um, <laughs> the, um, the Greek restaurant and a German restaurant. My father was friends with the family that owned the Greek restaurant, yes. Yes. That's still there. It keeps moving around, but it's still here. The same family, right? Yes. It, uh, it's moved downtown now. To Agora. Agora, Agora yes. Yeah. Right. They just re reengineered themselves to a new yeah, location down yeah. at Glenwood. Yeah. Kulapitas. Mm. I believe it was the family. Uh, so what was the nightlife like? What was the, was it swinging in Raleigh in the 60s, you know, with the the bottle clubs and the, you know, the... Uh... No, no. No, the, there was no liquor by the drink. <laughs> yeah. The first liquor by the drink occurred in Virginia, and so we would go up there to get a drink, right? That's a long way to go for a drink. Yeah, but <laughs> on your way to Washington or something like that, you could <laughs> stop at a, what's the um, famous fast food with a red roof? Howard Johnson's. H Howard Johnson's? Yeah. You could get a drink at Howard Johnson's? You could get a drink at Howard Johnson's. You were living the high life there, yeah. Brian. Well, and then a friend of mine who was a very good builder here in Raleigh, the Frog and Nightgown, which I designed, yeah. oh. was a jazz, oh. the jazz club, and we had all the jazz greats here in Raleigh. On Medlin Drive. Yes, on Medlin and then to Cameron Village. And then yes. it went underground. Right. Yeah. Well, the, this builder friend of mine, I invited him to the 
frog, and they charged him five dollars for ice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was boy, our brown bagging boy, fee. Was, yeah, brown bagging was the was the way you went in those days. Boy, was he upset. <laughs> People know the TV show Mad Men about the advertising business. Yeah. You were kind of the madman of Raleigh at that time. You had your Jaguar and you were flying around and you were teaching. No, and I had an Austin Healy. You had an Austin that. Healy. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So was there a, a small group of people that hung out together a lot in the arts and architecture or what was the social scene like? Well, most of the social life was with faculty mostly both in the School of Design. We struck up a friendship with people in the physics department, and so we had a good mixture there, different points of view of different things. And uh, we did socialise, and then, of course, when um, grass came into the scene, we were growing our own on a <laughs> CPNL <laughs> right away. We had a... You had a crop? Yes. <laughs> then we had a party, and if they derided us, there would have been no senior administration <laughs> at state. <laughs> <any. laughs> oh, that's priceless. <laughs> <laughs> and we were supposed to start by drinking something else and then eating and then smoking. And we did it all in a reverse order instead, and we were really out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are the parties of history. Yes. Michael, uh, what is the, the future of modern architecture? We're seeing the marquee architects, the architects, working on these projects, which inevitably seem to go way over budget and over time. And when the architects are, are criticized for that, they want to throw it back on the clients or the, the construction company. And it seems to be this cycle. Is that going to continue or do you see anything new emerging on these mega project scenes? Yeah, well, it's, it's really interesting. And it's something that we, we kind of touch on. Um, we're trying to get, build a bit of a thread through our podcast is, is um, talking to, to, to the big name architects that, that there seems to be quite quite a, a differing viewpoint on where the architect stands in these projects. I, you know, I'm sure it's the same in, in the states. I mean, there's a lot of design and build uh, projects where the architect will be kind of pushed aside once once things are going and the contractor gets to gets to make a lot of decisions and 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 the architect can feel quite sidelined and isn't seeing the building being realized that he he wanted um and there are there are other architects that can can somehow sort of embrace the process and you know manage to retain a control over you know what what the building you know how the building comes out so i mean to, to me that's the key kind of tension that's going on in, in, in these projects now is, is who's actually driving the project. You know, is, is it the contractor to get it on time and on budget or is it the, you know, the architect? And it varies depending on the architect, depending on the country and you know, the, the nature of the contract. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to give a general kind of answer to that. The question becomes really, who can estimate some of these projects? Because the architects seem to always underestimate them. But you know, who is out there that can take a building by Zaha Hadid or Richard Rogers or Norman Foster and, and actually tell us how much it's going to cost to build? In England, there's another profession called quantity surveying. And they are between the architect and the contractor. They, with each project, they issue a bill of quantities which describes every piece of the building from day one so that when it goes out to bid the same numbers are given to all the bidders so it then becomes a matter of price per square foot or linear foot or whatever the material involved is but in this country when you do a big project like a complicated building each contractor who's bidding on it has his own estimating department and there will, some of them will miss out a whole trade or something and get the job on the low bid and then things really go to hell. 
You're right. I mean, we we are seeing um, obviously the trend from the you know, the traditional bill of quantities through to to the, the now the BIM model. I mean, and often the you know the the, the lead architect will, will have created a, a BIM model, um, and, and then that would be adopted by the contractor, um, who who will then do the costing. Um, so yeah, as Brian says, it's, it's it's not really the architect that's doing the costing in the UK. It's very much uh, cost consultants, and yeah. uh, as, as you say, used to be. Um, uh, quantity surveyors. Michael, you've been doing your podcast, uh, which is a great set of shows. We'll have links to that on our website. You've been doing the podcast for six years, eight years? Y- yeah, I, th- I, think it's, I think it's, yeah, about yeah, six or seven years, yeah. So any advice to us, the, you know, <laughs> fledgling architecture podcast that you could share? No, no. I mean, I, I think it's just, it's just exciting that, um, the, the, we 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 started as you say uh, a few years back, and um, it was it was quite it was quite exciting because we were bringing the voice of architects out. That again, well, we could do that being digital, whereas uh, the magazines had been our forerunners. They you know they couldn't do anything like that. And I remember one of, one of the one of the great things that we we recorded. We wasn't an interview with Zaha. It was we recorded her at an RIBA event, and and we had lots of people come to us. And she, she you know she was such a big name. And people say, do you know what? You know, we've uh, we know everything about her. We know her buildings. We know, you know, we know, you know, where she was born. But we've never heard her voice. And and it and that was fantastic. That you know, the people around the world that we we took the voice of architecture out there. And that's kind of kind of stayed with me. No, it's just exciting. And now, of course, the uh, with the smartphones and the capability of streaming, it's this a whole new resurgence. It's just a very exciting. Uh, place to be, and I, I think it's you know, it's a little bit like in the beginning of the digital thing when we could send out messages and images by email. Now to to, to have that that access and you know to be able to create these kind of programs, it's just fantastic. And I, uh, it's just a, I've got no advice to offer you guys. This has been great. It's a great place to be. Well, Michael, thank you for joining us from London, and Brian, thanks for joining us here. Thank you, in Raleigh. It's been fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Sarah Sonk, the real estate agent who loves modernist houses just as much as you do, 919-601-7339. And by ModboxUSA.com and their swanky, colorful mailboxes, including a new model that attaches right to your house, just like 1954. Thanks for listening. I'm George Smart with Frank King. Take us out, Tom. Visit U.S. Modernist Radio on the web at usmodernistradio.org for links about people and buildings mentioned today on the show. We record at Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. You can email us at comments at usmodernistradio.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of North Carolina Modernist Houses, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild, George and Frank, and I'll be back in two weeks with another namaste, grounded, natural fiber, <laughs> child of the universe, <laughs> downward-facing dog edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. 